Well, hello to my podcast family here on Amazing Greats. It's Rick Hansen here. Thank you for joining us once again this time around. And today, oh man, we have got some great guests. It's a couple, a power couple. He was a network executive, she a comedian. They both together have written books. They've uh, executive produced movies. They have a Facebook page. They have um, a, a store. I mean, this is this is a couple that just keeps blazing a new trail. And I loved every second of our conversation. And I think you will too. Join us as we I introduce to you Louise Duarte and Squire Rushnell on Amazing Greats. Well, here we are on Amazing Greats, the podcast, and I have two special guests with us today. This is kind of exciting because it's the first time I've done a podcast with two people. So this is going to be interesting. And, and I know I've seen you guys on podcasts and on interviews and so forth. So I know this works well. You guys are you're great. And uh, it's the only the, the question will be, well, whether... I can get through it. Okay. So, <laughs> so here we go. We do so, everything together. That's right. <laughs> I know. Isn't that great? That's well, uh, actually, they don't call us Squire and Louise. We're known as Squeeze. Yeah. Because we're always together. <laughs> Never separate. So you can talk to a singular person <laughs> or the two of us. And you have your choice. Whoever has the appropriate answer will just spit it out, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> So we're all the way from Puget Sound in Washington State to Martha's Vineyard, uh, is about as far as as we can get away from one another physically. Yeah. But it's great to have you here with us. I love. We're sitting in your home in Martha's Vineyard, and it's so warm and cozy. And thank you for being with us today. Let me introduce you first here with all of the embarrassing stuff about your your credentials, in a in a nutshell. And then we're going to talk more about that as well. But first of all, we're talking with Louise Duart. And Squire Rushnell, and uh, Louise is known as one of the world's best comedic impressionists. You worked ten years on stage and and on TV and with with a couple of the other greats, Harvey Corman and Tim Conway, for years. Um, you have like a hundred impressions that you do, and we may even ask you to do a couple a little later. Uh, you've been uh, had a, a, your own talk show as well on the ABC Family Channel for like what was it ten year eight year eight seasons something eight like years. that. Yeah. And Squire Rushnell, a man, a successful uh, executive at ABC. You were the guy that they um, attribute the fact that Good Morning America became a number one in the country at one point. Uh, mm -hmm. You're the father of an Emmy award winning Schoolhouse Rock as a part of the ABC After School specials. And you're credited with coining the phrase God winks, which we're going to find out a whole lot more about here in just a couple of minutes. And so that's where we're going to launch. I want to know uh, your tell us the definition. I know you've said this so many times and in so many ways. But what is a God wink? Well, a God wink is one of those little coincidences that you know isn't. And in fact, if you look up coincidence in the dictionary, it says two extraordinary events coming together without an apparent cause. Well, a God wink is two extraordinary events coming together with a cause, and that cause is divine. And so we had no idea when we started kicking around uh, what was a coincidence when I was writing the first book, uh, When God Winks, and we, we tried to figure out what 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 is it? Uh, if people say there's no coincidence to coincidence, well, then what the heck do you call it? And so, but we had no idea that we were really filling a vacancy in the language, that there was no word for what God wink is now. Uh, something you think is a coincidence, but it isn't, and you know that it comes from God. That is a God wink. And so the word, because it filled that vacancy, it went into the language very, very quickly. And a word, well, quickly. I say quickly, but it was 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it is becoming, uh, I think we are at that tipping point where God wink is now becoming uh, pretty much a household word. Five years on the Today Show helped and uh, four seasons of the number one uh, God wink Christmas movies on Hallmark has helped. Uh, Rescued by Ruby at Netflix has helped. 
and just basically are doing 12 books that have it into the marketplace. And word of mouth is really what has helped the most. Absolutely. And it is, uh, you know, I, I I think at one point you said it might be in the dictionary soon, and I don't know if it is or isn't. I, I, I don't Since know that I'm, for sure. But yeah. it did bother me the fact that I was, um, my autocorrect on, uh, <laughs> still wants to break them apart, still doesn't oh, want to yeah. call them Godwings, you know? So yeah. that bothers me. But yeah, <laughs> it is, it's become a household uh, word yeah. and it's because of the great work that you guys have done and you, you mentioned a few of the things that i wanted to mention which is all the books and the movies and you both have like been the executive producers of those four movies tell yeah. us how the the books moved from books to movies i mean was that something they approached you about or how did how did all that come together well, I think um, the the uh, in the beginning, I, I I've always been a storyteller. I guess coming out of ABC, coming out of radio in in the in the beginning, and I've I've always loved storytelling, and but I I always pictured every one of these stories as a mini movie, and so I I saw it come playing out like that. So, uh, but I was always scared to death of going to ABC, where I worked for 20 years, or um, CBS or NBC, where I, I have colleagues and friends, uh, because I know that network executives are innately bullies. I used to be one, <laughs> you know, and so I don't like that title. Change that, you know. <laughs> and, and so I, I was always a little wary about uh, going to a network where you get signed up and then they have the right to change things. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, you know, that God wink word could get turned into tiddly winks. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so, but Hallmark, it struck me, was always the perfect brand match, mm -hmm. that their brand came out of uh, family and, uh, and, uh, and, and wonderful family relationships. And I also had admired Bill Abbott, who had been the CEO, who had really built the, uh, the network into the number one dramatic channel in the world. And, um, and so I just felt that that was um, a, a good fit. And, uh, and so we prayed about it. We pray about everything. And, um, and as a matter of fact, it was an event uh, for Pat Boone, Yes, that led us to our first meeting at Hallmark with Randy Pope. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Godwink and Pope. There's also an angel in this story. All right, a I'm guy gonna... named Dan Angel and a and a squire. So there was a squire, <laughs> a pope, and an angel. Yeah, but I was asked to perform at Pat's 80th birthday party, and um, it was then that we then had an appointment. We made an appointment with with Hallmark and they love the idea of the Godwinks. And it was really in their wheelhouse, you know, yeah. it. But but the fact is uh, that they're not just good stories, but they're real stories. They're yeah. every story is true. Yeah. So at the end of each movie, you see the actual people that had happened to. And it just connected with their audiences. And they were number one, you know, every time they would air a Godwink Christmas, it would be number one. And people would say the same thing, you know, it gave me so much hope. Mm. And then when they saw the real people, it's like, oh my gosh, that could be me. So I think that just inspired us to keep writing. And then what one of the funny things that happened, how God works, it was a God wink. Mm -hmm. We had actually pitched, you know, when you go to Hallmark, you pitch like three different movie ideas and they'll pick one of them. And we knew that Bill Abbott loved dogs. So we had this great dog story about Ruby, a rescue dog, you know, rescued by a, a Rhode Island police officer. So we pitched that and they turned it down. So they went with another one, which was fine. But it wasn't it Bill. It was one of his uh, <laughs> lieutenants who was second guessing Bill. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He says now that he would have never turned that down. Well, because in the because <laughs> Bill loves dogs so much, and he doesn't like to see them in jeopardy. Well, in the first act, Ruby's about to be euthanized. Almost the first scene. So, yeah. so yeah. you know, it turns out well. But <laughs> yeah. in the first scene, 
So we we told we we got a call from our producing partner, Dan Angel. So Dan Angels, we told him what happened. He said, I can't believe that they turned it down. He said, well, listen, I'll call you back. I'm at a meeting with Netflix. And he said, I'll call you after my meeting. So he calls us after the meeting and he says, you're not going to believe this. This is a real God wing. He said, I pitched all the movies that because he does movies on his own, all the movies. And they turned every one of them down. And I got up to leave and I said, well, I have one more. And he pitched <laughs> the Ruby, the dog story. Wow. And he must have done a good job because they started crying, you know, oh, oh and, my. Wow. and they said, that's the one we want. So we get to do Ruby. And I have to be honest with you. Netflix was great. They left us alone. It's a G rated movie. Yeah. Very family. How many of those? I can know. You can you see? You know, yeah. But yeah. we I think they were shocked. We 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 weren't really surprised because we knew that that the audience would embrace such a beautiful, hopeful story. But it was number two in the world for the first 28 days and yeah. then number one with kids. So it did so well. And for us, it was like it was a dream come true, because as much as we love Hallmark, we want to continue to do work on Hallmark. Netflix was like the number one streamer. So 220 million households it gets into and all around the world, people saw it. And Ruby was number two all around the world. And it showed us that people want hope. No matter every what country, single country, every single and, country. In about 100 con- countries, we were either number one or number two. And so that was a fascinating experience in real time to uh, a, a network that reached at that moment 222 million households. And and you could look at it in mm-hmm. real time that that in Sri Lanka, we're number one. <laughs> hey, in Australia, we're, we're Sri number Lanka. two. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just this year. That was uh, early yeah, part that was, of 2022, right? It was. It was yes. uh, and it's still available on Netflix. Still, oh, yeah. yeah. If, still if someone doing has great. not seen it yet. Yeah. yeah. IMDb has called it the third best Netflix movie of the year. Yeah. So, wow. I love yeah. that. <laughs> that huh? I know. It's, it's, just, it's a God thing, truly. Yeah. It, was a, it was a God wing for sure. <laughs> That's what I love about you. And I love your story and, and all the stories that you tell. You know, by the way, Pat Boone, I don't know if you know this, was one of my guests on Amazing Greats yeah. and told his whole life story. In fact, uh, he he's a great talker great storyteller yes and so we split that up in two and had you know pat boone one and pat boone two in two different podcasts but, oh, but what a great, great guy he was and yeah he is interesting great. that you bring him up and he's a yes. friend of yours as well so yes he yeah. is and yeah. loved loved mama boone yeah. mama shirley we loved her so yeah, much she, she was great she was the one who called me yeah, and asked just, me to perform at pat's uh, 80th yeah yeah she loved two things about <laughs> us before she met us <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> because her daughter had uh, seen us uh, perform at a church uh uh, we Debbie were or that. one of the other daughters. It Debbie was Debbie. uh Cherry. I think it Cherry. Was, okay. I think it was Cherry Boone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We knew Debbie from from uh, before. Squire from before did. I worked with her. Squire yeah. did. You you could talk about Debbie in a second. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but uh, and we saw her, uh, one of your shows with her. But anyway, uh, we um, we loved the fact that she loved God winks and she loved partnered prayer, mm-hmm. which is. An, advoca- an advocacy that we have, mm-hmm. uh, which we can talk about, not right now, but uh, which where we advocate two people praying together for five minutes a day for 40 days. Mm-hmm. Amazing things. Yes. Happen. Yeah, yeah. And so that was what led her yes. to saying, Chi, do you think let's figure out how we can get Louise <laughs> roped into uh <laughs> Pat's uh, 80th birthday yeah. at the uh, Beverly Hilton. Yeah, yeah, it was Amazing. fun. Yeah. yeah, Amazing. And so did you did you do your impersonations at the 80th? I did or? a little Joan Rivers. Can we talk here? You know, <laughs> how did you do my Joan Rivers? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I did I did some I did some George Barnes. I closed. Uh, <laughs> I closed with my George Barnes. <laughs> and I did a little Judge Judy. 
Man, some meat at Bunker, I get a slew of them. You have no idea. <laughs> uh, I actually have a, a, a piece in my act where I have 25 celebrities get locked in an elevator. I've seen it. Oh, it's it's oh, fantastic. Yeah. It is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah. So they go back and forth. It's like, oh, like- man. And I love it. And, you, and they kind of tell a story with one another, right? In yeah. the yeah. elevator. Yeah. So now, a little schizophrenic. Six of my best friends are Sybil. Well, I had a dream the other night that I got to go to the Academy Awards, and I was so excited because all my favorite stars were there from film and television. We got into this backstage elevator with all of them, and all of a sudden the elevator doors got stuck. Oh, oh The elevator doors down open! Oh, my! We're all stuck in here and can't get out! Look at that Rosie O'Donnell. She's sucking all the air out of the elevator. Can we talk here? Joe Miv is here. I gotta get out of this elevator. I have plastic surgery in an hour. Oh, uh, uh, uh. This is Jane Fonda. Everyone just calm down. We're going to do some claustrophobic aerobics. I want you to stretch and get them and feel the pain. Now, Rick, let me ask you something. Does this make sense? I never know who I'm waking up next to. <laughs> We share. We have no idea, babe. <laughs> uh, yeah, amongst them, you know, I did a list of, there's like a hundred or something that you can yeah. do. But yeah, Joan Rivers, Cher, Bart Simpson, yeah. Judge Judy, uh, Barbara Streisand, yeah. uh, Barbara Walters. Do a little Barbara Walters for us. Well, I love Barbara Walters. You know, I've interviewed everyone from Ronald Reagan to Robert Redford from Russell and Russell to Roger Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, oh my goodness well this is so great so the the two of you um and i i'd love to to share this story as well uh the, the fact that you're even together as one uh yeah. is through a god wink that was yes. pretty amazing in and of itself right yes sure. it really How did you guys come together well, I was uh, the first time I met Louise was a long time ago, uh, and that was like mm, 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago. Uh, and I was running children's television at ABC. And I had uh, in my first marriage, I had two little girls, like seven and nine. And there was a show that was playing at Madison Square Gardens, Felt Forum, and uh, and it was one of those costume shows like Sesame Street uh, goes on the road with uh, characters and so forth. And this was done by Sid and Marty Croft, and it was based upon H.R. Puffin Stuff, one of the big hits at that time. And um, and uh, so uh, I was there among 2,000 young kids screaming, <laughs> and when... The star of that show came on the stage, burst on the stage with a green face, a long nose, and a wart on it. I realized that that was somebody very exciting. It was Witchy Poo, but whoever that character was, was somebody who was very dynamic. I had no idea what her name was. And about two weeks later, I was in a meeting with the Crofts again, and they said, well, uh, look at we're working on this uh, wraparound group that we want to that you want to have for Saturday morning, kind of a group that would uh, tie together the whole Saturday morning schedule like jingles on a radio station. That was my idea. And so they created this group called Captain Cool and the Kongs, kind of a rip off of Kiss at that time, you know, with, the, you know, a lot of face paint and fancy costumes, but they were missing a comedian. And uh, and so I said, what about the girl who played Witchy Poo? I said, what about the girl with Witchy Poo? Okay, well, let's go get her. Okay, right. The guy in the suit wants so, that girl. The network <laughs> suit, yeah. Get her. Anyway, I knew nothing about any of that, except that about two months later, we were doing a, um, a presentation to our advertisers in New York about all of the fall programs on on the schedule and we always put together this wonderful little party for the advertisers invited them to bring their kids and so that was a big attraction for the agencies and always gave us a little edge over the other two networks and um 
And so we had Captain Cool and the Kongs. And that was the first time I had ever met Louise Duarte. And uh, uh, another kind of, uh, I don't know whether it's God winky or not, but that party was the first uh, event at a new restaurant in New York City. It was Windows on the World mm. at the top of the World Trade Center. Mm. Their first event, our party, was the first time I ever met Louise. Mm. We thought about that a lot after 9-11. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but when we met and Corsquara gave me my first break in television, I mean, I, I was so grateful to him. Of course, he was the network executive. I was a lowly little actor, but um, he was so nice to all all the underlings. You know, you always had time for people and he was just such a nice guy. And I would write to him. In those days, we didn't have email. We actually had to write letters. I would write to him every so often just to give him an update of what was happening in my career. And he was always nice enough to write back. And we'd see each other once in a while, like if I was doing a talk show or something, we'd run into each other. Or if you were on Good Morning America right. one time, I saw you in the green room, right. the ABC affiliate meetings, right. and that kind of thing. Yeah. But I was doing a, a Broadway show <clears throat> called Cat, uh, called um, Dream Stuff, and a fellow came backstage, in, a stage manager, and he said, there's a gentleman named Squire Rushnell who's in the audience. He wants to see you. After the show, and I said, oh, my gosh, he's the guy who gave me my first break. If it wasn't by him, I'd never be in the business. Well, unbeknownst to, to me, Squire, who was supposed to go to Canada that week, and here's the God wink coming, with his son. He has a brain-injured son. And with brain-injured kids, you can't just say, we're going to do this and then switch, you know, do a switcheroo. It's like they get focused on something. Well, he was supposed to go to Canada with some meetings, and he was going to take Grant on some wonderful little family outings. And then the meeting got canceled last minute. So he said to Grant, well, let's go to a Broadway musical because Grant loves musicals. And he opens up the New York Times. He sees Dream Stuff with my name, Louise Duarte. Oh, it's an old friend. Let's go see her. Well, when the show ended that night and I went into the when I saw him in the foyer, I looked at him and I just knew in my heart. Now, we've both been divorced for a while. I knew that he was the one God had for me. And we went out for coffee. We've had coffee every day since, but here's the amazing God wing. That was the last performance of the show. We closed that night. So if I had come along the next day, this God wink wouldn't have happened. And that's the way divine alignment works mm. in our lives. Divine alignment are when two events take place and there's there's a there's a, a a crossroads there's always a god wink there it's like that moment that you met the girl that you ended up marrying it was the time that you you got to a place and if you had been there five minutes early or five minutes later, you wouldn't have met the person who gave you your first job or opened up your career, mm. opened up your faith, changed your life. God uses divine alignment to nudge us into place so he can deliver us God winks. Yeah. And that's what happened to us. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I love that story. <laughs> and there's so many stories that you have uncovered since you started all of this. And if you could pick out one and just say, here's a God story, a God, God wing story that just blew me away, besides your own, mm -hmm. uh, that ended up either in a movie or a book, or just just give us one of the greatest God wing stories you got. Well, I think, are you thinking David and Tony? No, I'm thinking Stacia, because that's short and to oh, the point. Stacia. I think Stacia, yeah, well, I think that's um, a fun, that's a, that's a good one. All right. Stacia is a story about a young girl who uh, was in her early 20s working in Colorado, Denver, Denver. And um, and she grew up in a in a show business background and so forth. And uh, she got one of those phone calls in the middle of the night that her dad had died of a heart attack. And so she she rushed to uh, pack a bag. She rushed to the airport, bought tickets. She went on the plane, picked up a new morning paper and sat down in the seat next to the window, opened up the paper. And there was her father's picture. 
Emmett Kelly, world famous clown, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, dead at 80. She sat there and she looked at that headline and she just felt so sad. She was on her way to Sarasota, Florida to, 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 to be with her mother and her uh, siblings. And, and then she, she, she reached into a bag, just a little memorabilia that she had thrown into it. And she pulled out an old newspaper, a yellowed newspaper. Now, her father... Emmett Kelly was the clown who had the sad face. All other clowns had grins from ear to ear, but Emmett Kelly always had a sad face. And it was so endearing. And that's why he was with Ringling Brothers for 20 years, their number one clown. And But he always had a rule, never be caught in a photograph with anything but his trademark face. Never let anybody see the sad face crown, clown uh, smiling. And it, he was successful all of his life, except for one time. He was being interviewed by an AP, AP photographer reporter. And, uh, and, uh, and he was like backstage at, at, a, at a theater somewhere. And uh, the phone rang and, uh, and, uh, and it said, it's for you, Emmett. And so he he gets up and he talks to the person and he's, oh, hi, doctor. And the doctor says, congratulations, Emmett. You are the father of a new baby girl. And he went like this. And the photographer went click. And the next day, that newspaper, that picture went out to newspapers all around the globe. It was the only picture ever taken of the sad face clown smiling. Okay. And so as, as Stacia pulled out that old yellowed newspaper and opened it up, it was that treasured picture. And, yeah. and suddenly as she looked at it, she saw something that she had never seen before. You know how God gives you the ability to see things at the right time that you have never seen before that have been right in front of you. She saw what he was smiling about. He was smiling about her and she began to cry. There was a man seated next to her. He leaned over and he said, miss, are, are you okay? And she said, yes. She pointed to the picture and said, my father died last night. He turned white. He said, you're not going to believe this. I'm the photographer who took that picture 25 years ago. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I know. <laughs> he said he was so happy that day. He, he loved that you were born. Mm. And that relationship began a new friendship yeah. because a few months later, when Stacia got married, she she hired him to come and be the photographer for her wedding. I know. I know. <laughs> That's how God winks work. Yes. God winks come along when they are impossible. They come along with that. They defy any odds yeah. because with God, there are no odds. Right. And and they always bring you comfort. Yeah, always. And I think one of the things that I saw you say, and I, and I just want to bring it up quickly here, is that God winks can be big. Big deals, or they could be yeah. little deals. Oh, uh, little bitty ones. But he's yeah. winking. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so yeah. that's obviously a huge one because yeah. that was like a, a, a double wink right there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. That's fantastic. So, um, what about the. So, so God wink is kind of, as you said, is kind of a, a word that really. Uh, brings home the idea of a God nudge or an answered prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody had really kind of found that word uh, until now that works and it works <laughs> for all of that. Uh, yeah. But what about the times when people think, gosh, where's God now? Mm -hmm. Where's God's wink now? Why, mm -hmm. why isn't my prayer answered? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there a response to that? Is there a way to, to not, get by that? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't blame God for anything. 
Uh, and um, I, uh, I do believe that the most Godwink stories that we receive, we receive all the time over our Facebook uh, Godwink pages. And yeah. Louise does a, uh, a private group uh, with like 20,000 uh, private group fans, uh, yeah. and they all share prayer. Mm -hmm. and, we, and, and on the Godwink I, Facebook page. I'm I, a member now, by the way. Oh, good. I'm a member. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> That's good. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> and on the public page, I always share stories. And, uh, and so those stories are always coming in. But the vast majority, I think, of stories are at times of sorrow. Mm. Because I think that's when we are, number one, maybe more prepared. We may be more humble, more vulnerable when we've lost someone we love. And, and, and so we're open to receive God winks mm -hmm. and God winks happen when we allow them to happen. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, I've never had a God wink. Well, mm -hmm. probably haven't allowed it, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and, and so let's like those things that are right there in front of us that we didn't see before. But when we look for them, mm -hmm. when you seek me, you will find me mm -hmm. says the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And when you seek God winks, you will see them. Mm -hmm. And once you see them, you keep on seeing them. They'll happen all the time. But yeah. that's what I believe that uh, I think that at those times of sorrow, that's when God comes in and he also gives us more God mm -hmm. winks. He gives us those messages of hope mm -hmm. and their and their messages of comfort yeah and and you know he his word says he never leaves us or forsakes us and i know oftentimes people say where are you god you know where were you when i i lost my child where were you when i you know in that and that fire and i you, know, you just it, it's so difficult but you know we live in the world he says but we're not of the world yeah. and this time on earth is really but a blink of an eye. But he tells us we will have trials and tribulations. We will. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way the world is. But there is something awaiting us that's so beautiful. And all those tears that we shed, he says he actually bottles them up. So he loves us so much. And he's with us during the most trying, horrible times. And, you know, we it, it's we can be kind of just, oh, well, it's well, you, you know, just get over it. But it's you don't get over you get on with it, but you never get over it. But the one thing about God winks is they are messages of hope. And there was a an old evangelist years ago in the 1600s that said, "When I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't." He didn't know the word God winks. We can't then. blame him right. for that. Yeah. But when you pray, <laughs> and we know this to be true, when you pray, God winks happen yeah. um, more you, often. More often, yeah. it's you know. In all your ways, acknowledge me, he says, and I'll direct your steps. And God winks are like those little gifts left at your, your doorstep. But you have to open the door and open your gifts. So when you acknowledge God and everything, you see them all the time. Yeah. We were just listening to Joyce Meyer, who loves God winks. <laughs> and she she said, she was saying to God one day, oh, how come I don't get God winks? I got you should get them all the time. How come I don't get them right now? <laughs> and God said to her, Joyce, I give them to you all the time. You're just so used to them now. <laughs> and so I think that's, we get used to, I mean, Squire and I, we always will say, oh, you know, thank you. We want to acknowledge, yeah. thank you, God. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and do you want to tell, is it okay if you, you tell that uh, Joyce Meyer uh, watch cloth story? I well, she was what, praying, yeah. she, her and her husband, Dave, they were just dirt poor. And she was praying and uh, she, she needed 12, wash rags yeah well she said that she prayed for everything everything you know yeah, yeah. but she needed 12 wash rags yeah and uh and she thought well you know that seems so silly but i i, I need them and she said the next day there's a knock at the door is a woman who said i don't know god just told me you needed these and she gave her the 12 wash rags and that she said that increased her faith so much. And I think yeah. that's what God winks do. They're faith builders. Yeah. So she never forgot that. And I think yeah. if we journal our God winks, 
you will see if you journal them every time you get one and date it. And when you look back a month from now, you will be amazed to how many God winks you have. And it'll really increase your faith and give you so much more hope and encouragement. Yeah. And one of the things that you said said along the way, and I picked up on it because I think it's so true, and that is that uh, for skeptics and for new believers, um, the God wink idea, the concept of the God wink is... Uh, kind of the shallow end of the pool. It's oh, like yes. the op- the opportunity to see God at work uh, in in real time in real life, right? Yeah, That's exactly. and 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 that, and that was brought brought home one day when with the best compliment we ever had from a pastor from uh, from Jim Reeves. Jim Reeves, yeah, in uh, Faith in Community Church Faith Community in, in West Covina, Covina. outside of L.A. <laughs> we were having lunch, and he was so excited. We were just getting the Hallmark movie, and he was just so glad, and everything else. And he said, "Oh gosh, you, you know what I love about you guys is, is it, 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 it you're so shallow." And he said, "No, no, no, I didn't." <laughs> I didn't mean that. He says, no, 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 no. Or, you know, we pastors bring him into the deep end. You bring him into the shallow end. And in. we said, yeah, yeah that's right. That's love our, that. That's... We are shallow, shallow people. people. <laughs> Listen, Schoolhouse Rock is for shallow people. Yeah. I was. That's three minutes of history <laughs> in between Bugs Bunny and Scooby Doo yeah. on Saturday morning and learning conjunction, junction. What's your function? And and that's my whole background. Yeah. Is- conjunction, junction. What's your function? Hooking up. Work. And phrases and clauses. Conjunction, junction, how's that function? I got three favorite cards that get most of my job done. Shallow and simple. End of the pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a buddy of mine who does, he, he, speaking of journaling, uh, he has a pile of, a, a rock pile that every time there's a God wink, um he adds a rock to the pile and this pile I continues to grow and, right yeah yeah and oh, so he has I an opportunity that it, he sees it, it before his very eyes what what all of the things that god has done for him right so oh, oh i love that. oh I, you know what i'd love i'd love him to to write me and yes. tell me that and send me a picture of that rock pile. oh my gosh and that's we'll, fabulous we'll blast that out to uh i to love our, it our fans. I will do that. His name's Chris yeah. Balashotis, and I will have him connect back right. with you. Great. Yes. Yeah, squire Love. at godwinks.com. <laughs> All or right. if you'd he, rather write to Louise, Louise <laughs> at godwinks.com. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump into uh we, we always like to find out the the personal stories, and I want to get both of your personal stories. But where oh. did where uh let's maybe start with Louise? Where yeah. Did you first find Jesus? What when did he enter you? Was it like a lightning bolt kind of an affair? Or how did how did you become? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I there were maybe five or six different people who told me about the Lord. And I just I was brought up Catholic, but you know, I was I was starting to get into show business and I just didn't have time for that, you know. But uh then my husband left me suddenly, my first husband. And I was taken down. And my sister-in-law uh, told me, you need, you need Jesus. She had just accepted the Lord. And so I did accept Christ. And then the next day, I went to a church called St. Joseph's Catholic Church. And I went in there, but it was a charismatic Catholic church. And, and there was singing, and there was so much joy. And it was just an amazing place. And there was a, a priest, Father Lou Gavoni who said, you know, God is healing people. And I never heard that, you know, healing people. My sister-in-law said, yeah, you know, and these people healing over here. And and then he said, there's someone who just accepted Christ, who has a lump on their left hand, on their ring finger, and God is going to heal it right now. And he wants you to know that he's He's given you a miracle. So you'll remember that when you go through difficult times in life, remember, just claim it in the name of the Lord. You'll feel a heat going through your hand. And I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. Claim it in the name of the Lord. I didn't know what even what that meant. But all of a sudden, I felt this heat going through my hand. I had had a lump. And my sister-in-law and I watched the lump disappear. No and way. I had a miracle. And let me just tell you something. I have been in it's like god that's just one of countless miracles that the god that god has done in my life but my career started really because 
when my husband left, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, how am I going to pay the bills? Because he left me for another woman. We won't get into all the dirty details. <laughs> but what happened was I was praying with some friends and they said, Louise, you do all those wacky voices for us. I just had a talent to do voices. Never thought I could do it professionally. Why don't you go down to one of those comedy clubs, see if you can do it for a living. So I, I'm thinking their cheese had slipped off the crackers. Like I'm a homemaker, <laughs> San Fernando Valley now. Yeah, I'm not going to. So what happened was during the night, I felt the Lord speaking so strongly, like, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? Just go down there. And he gave me the courage to, to drive down Sunset Boulevard to the comedy store, got on stage did some impressions. It was open, open mic night. Yeah. So, you know, the non-professionals could have like five minutes. <clears throat> Unbeknownst to me, Star Search Scouts were in the audience there to see 10 other comics. And they saw me and they put me on the show. And Donna Summer was switching the channels one night. And she sees Star Search, this wacky woman doing these crazy voices. And she calls her manager, Susan Maneo. And she says, get me that girl to be my opening act. And that is how it began. Oh, my talk God. about a God a great housewife in great San story. Fernando Valley mm -hmm. to opening act at the, uh, at the Donna Greek Summer. theater. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. who who knew? Only God knew. Yeah. And by the way, when I would pray, God, I, I, I was believe it or not, I don't sound like, but I, I was painfully shy. <laughs> and that's why I did voices because I escaped into other people. But God had spoken <laughs> to my heart saying, I'm going to give you voices to reach many people. And I thought he meant, you know, a voice to reach people about oh, the man. Lord because I loved it. I didn't know he meant literally, <laughs> but I also didn't know that he had Squire waiting in the wings for me seven years later, yeah. you know, and that yeah, we would yeah. get together and it would be the love of my life and that he would use us in this yeah. way. Who was the first voice you did at that comedy club? Oh, pro I think it was, I think it was Joan. I have to say, I love Joan Rivers. I, <laughs> I do. I really, really, and I think I did Catherine Hepburn. Of course I did Catherine. And I did Jane Fonda. I did Jane Fonda and Catherine Hepburn doing a doing a little thing together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, Squire, you're up. Tell me, tell me where you found God. Well, I always thought I knew God, and because I grew up in a little hick town. Uh, <laughs> called Adams Center, 25 miles from the Canadian border. And uh, and I just, I always prayed. Uh, my mother sent me to church with my paper route money, and I had to go and put something in the plate. And so I just thought I believed in God. But when, uh, when I came face to face with a major crisis in my life, I realized that I I was I really didn't know much about God, and uh, I had never read the Bible, and um, and that crisis that I had was um, when uh, when you go into the hospital to have a baby, you expect that you're going to come out and hand out cigars and and just uh, just have a joyful time. You never expect that you're going to go into the hospital and the doctor's going to say, I'm sorry, your baby was born in cardiac arrest. If he lives, um, he probably, he, he will have se severe brain damage. And so I was um, standing over his incubator at Lenox Hill Hospital, and uh, my uh, my prior wife uh, had uh, uh, had cesarean section, so she couldn't even see the baby. And there he was in the incubator. I counted eighteen different tubes and wires coming out of his body. There was one tube that went into his mouth, and and all these other wires. And there was a meter there that that I finally figured out what it meant that he was doing five percent of the breathing. And the machine was doing 95% of the breathing. Mm -hmm. That wasn't good. And so um, I, I just, I started thinking things like, 
what is, you know, what, what do you do? I mean, what, what does a responsible father do at the, a time like this? And, and I started thinking, where do I even bury a child in New York City when I haven't figured out where, where my family's getting buried? I, 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 we had never talked about that. And a lady came up to me who I, I really think was an angelic mm. messenger on earth. Mm -hmm who said something that was kind of weird. She said, have you thought of taking a picture of your baby? And I looked at her oddly. I mean, I'm thinking this, here's a child with 18 different tubes and wires coming out of him. And then she finished the sentence. She said, I came into this hospital a year ago and my baby was stillborn. I left the hospital and I had no evidence that I had ever given birth to a baby. Mm. Well, I did take a picture. But I also realized that my child, my little boy, is still alive. And instead of worrying about where I'm going to bury this child, maybe I better start praying to God to save this child. And I just begged God to save this child. Well, I committed to praying over his that incubator around the clock. And it was on the second day, about uh, five o'clock in the morning. And uh, not many people in the neonatal unit at Lenox Hill Hospital. And all of a sudden, his body started to shake. And I called the nurse over and she said, oh, my goodness, he's having a seizure. She went to run to get a doctor. And now I was looking and praying over uh, my little boy and saying, God, please save him. Then I saw something that was startling. Through that tube that was coming out of his throat, it was a transparent tube. I saw something dark that was moving through it. You see, when my son was in utero, he had inhaled his own body waste, and they called that macomium. And so his little lungs were clogged with his own body waste. And I don't believe they could even operate on a little baby for that. And that's why he was in such straits. But this dark substance was going through the tube. God was casting off what was in his lungs. And the evidence of that was that meter, which went from 5% breathing on his own up to 20%, up to 30%. And by the time he was 48 hours old at about 8.30 in the morning, he was breathing 50, 50 on his own. And they said he was the miracle baby of Lenox Hill Hospital. Mm -hmm. I pledged myself to God on that day. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I then <laughs> met Louise about uh, maybe 10 years after that. And she was skilled at the Bible <laughs> and she led me into it. And we began praying together every single day. Mm -hmm. And we now have a ministry called Pray Together, Stay Together, because I saw the power of prayer in yeah. that experience, and that, Boy. there was no question about yeah. it. God exists. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that story. And and my, may I say, uh, you both such great um, storytellers. I mean, uh, <laughs> you you bring us right in and make it real. And I I really appreciate that. So let's talk about couples praying together. Then the yes. book, because um, I think that was, um, you know, a, a bit of a departure from your God wink, but at the mm -hmm. same time, still certainly mm -hmm. devoted to God. Uh, how uh, how did that all come about? You guys pray together mm -hmm. every single day, right? Oh, every yeah. day. Yeah. And, and we we saw <clears throat> the power in that, and mm -hmm. and we we knew that when we prayed, we also in the presence of God, where there was the three of us a lot of decisions that we make in our lives were because of the discernment that he would give us in our prayer or so. So we just went out and tried to find other couples saying, you know, do you guys pray together? 
and we told them the power of it. And so it started like kind of a little a little group of, of friends that started praying together and they were coming back saying, wow, this prayer thing is really amazing. And so then we decided we were going to go and find evidence, which we couldn't find evidence about what happens when people pray together at least five minutes a day for 40 days, like consistently. Mm-hmm. Couldn't find ev- any evidence. Any we research. To, any evidence. research. We yeah. went to Barna. Yeah. So we went to George Barna. I don't know. Barna did all, has a company that, uh, did all the research for a lot of big churches. And uh, so we, we we wormed our way into meeting George Barna. And we said, George, we, we'd love to talk to you about research on people praying together. And he said, in 25 years, I've never done any research on that. Praying consistently. Praying consistently yeah. together. Mm-hmm. People praying consistently together. And so we said, well, how come? He said, nobody's ever asked me. Mm-hmm. And so that led us to Baylor University, the Institute for the Studies of Religion, which does many of these research uh, uh, studies for, you know, those Time magazine covers about God is God dead and mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. And um, so we got to uh, the head of, of, uh, of Baylor uh, uh, Institute for the Studies of Religion, and we asked him about research of people praying together. And he said, I'm also ashamed. We've never done a study on what happens when people pray together consistently. He said, but we'll start now. If you can, if you can collect mm-hmm. the data, if you can get the research, we'll, we'll do the research studies. And if you can get the people together to pray together and, and do the studies and so forth. And, and he says, we will we'll do the evaluation. So we have been collecting research data for about 10 years now. We want to get it up to like five, 6,000 people who have prayed together. So we really have a body of evidence. And um, and so far, it, uh, you know, just a little bit of data that we do have, uh, things like showing appreciation, that goes up by 30% to each other. Mm-hmm. And the fear of, uh, of divorce drops, drops to, to zero. zero. When you start praying mm-hmm. together, and um, and then romance skyrockets up twenty one percent. That always gets the attention of guys. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we if you go to praystay dot com or dot org, either one. That will tell you everything you want to know about Pray Together, Stay Together, our, our ministry. And uh, we work with Sermon.net. We work with Baylor. We work with, uh, you can take the survey uh, with churches like Gateway Church, Joel Osteen's church, uh, uh, A.L. Bernard's church, uh, a whole number of big churches. Or you can take the survey just by yourself so that so that you're not a part of that group. This has been absolutely incredible. But before we you know, end this conversation, I want to make sure that everybody knows all of the things that you're into and up to right now. And so the, a way that we can support what you're doing. Uh, God right. Winkers is one of them, the Facebook page. Right? About well, we're we're working on some children's books. And uh, and then another one we want to do, of course, is for, for teens and for kids, how to teach kids how to look for the God Winks in their life. Because so many parents would say to us, you know, we love these stories. And and I tell and, and so, so many God Winks have happened, like like people like Joyce Meyer and others and ourselves, when we were kids, God winks happened. We just didn't know what to call them. So we want other kids to be encouraged. I mean, our whole ministry is really to, you know, as, as the great commission is preach the gospel throughout the world. We might not do it as com- in a conventional way. We do it through stories and we are the conduits for other people's testimonies we just feel privileged that people will tell us their testimony and we get to share it with the world we're the blabbermouth so so we're just we're going to keep doing movies we got a bunch of movies on the we have the fifth hallmark movie in uh, pre-development at this point uh, or in development and uh um, you know, Netflix is very pleased with the mm-hmm. Rescued by Ruby. They're still trying to figure out what they're doing in the future mm-hmm. after they've uh, had uh, some upset there with the stock. And other and streamers things. are looking at them. Yeah. So, so we, I think it's time. A lot of interest mm-hmm. from a lot of places. Yeah. And, 
We're, uh, we're excited. We're very excited. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to join uh, the God Winkers on Facebook, Louise's group, uh, we, we urge people to do that, uh, or to come to uh, godwinks.com and uh, to sign up for the Wink Letter, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which comes out twice a week, and uh uh, and, and which is kind of like the the wink story of the week. It's just mm -hmm. a, a little pick pick me upper story that you get right in your email uh, twice a week. So um, we we just love to have as many come on board. And as you got can. and you got the uh, the. I was hopefully going to get myself a Godwin cap before. Well, I, oh, yeah. we have to send you That's one. Right. You have to I, yeah. Give us your. You have just to tell email us about us. the store though. The store is on yeah. uh, Godwinks .com as well, right? Yes, yeah. godwinks.com. We have hats. We have all 12 books. The thing about our books, you can get these books uh, cheaper at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. No question about it. We we, 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 we love to have, we send people to, uh, <laughs> to those stores. But if you want to have it autographed, if you want every book autographed by Louise and me, there's a book plate that's that's in the the front of the book that uh oh, also free cards and then we also you can pick out a free greeting card mm -hmm. christmas card special day card you know all valentine's cards you know all of those cards and you can pick out from 20 different cards to go with the book if you want to give it to somebody thank you for being here god bless you and all the work you're doing thanks yeah. rick Thank you. Thank yeah. you so Ross much. Ross said you were a great interviewer, and he was so right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks kindly. God right. bless. You take care. Was that great or what? Every second of that conversation was inspiring and so entertaining. To our friends, Louise Duarte and to Squire Rushnell, thank you so much for being a part of the show and the podcast here at Amazing Greats. And to you, our audience, our listeners, thank you so much for being here today. Remember, if you liked it, click like or subscribe. That helps too. And let's uh, spread the word about these great testimonials from famous folks like our good friends, Louise and Squire. Have a great week. God bless.